Sonic, the heart of your system. Ryzen 3000 is finally here. We can talk about the details without breaking the NDA, which is cool. Finally, we can get rid of some of the rumors, clarify a lot of details about Ryzen 3000. There's a lot of stuff going on, especially looking back at early 2019 when there were rumors that the CPU would hit 5 GHz, which is obviously not possible, which you should be able to judge right now just by looking at the leaks. You should be able to know that Ryzen 3000 is not going to do 5 GHz. I can spoil it already. Before we get to it, I just want to address one video quickly. It's a video that AMD posted, I think, three, four days ago. It was about the AMD Precision Boost Overdrive, where AMD was basically saying that um, the CPUs can now overclock themselves better, depending what kind of mainboard you have. If you have a mainboard with a very strong VRM, then it can provide additional power to your CPU. It can overclock itself higher than previously. And then the guy, I think it was the technical marketing director of AMD, he was drawing a curve from 4.5 gigahertz like uh, normal and then 4.75 gigahertz afterwards after it would overclock itself. And I'm sitting there thinking, why? Why AMD? It's, it's like you look into the comments and everybody is saying, oh my God, it would automatically overclock itself to 4.75 so we can overclock it to five. Why do you do this? It's in the end, AMD is just disappointing customers. The CPUs are really, really solid, don't get me wrong. But saying or giving people the impression that the CPU would do automatically 4.75 overclocked and you can get more out of them, is just completely wrong because none of them will do those clocks. It's simply not possible. I tested over 10 CPUs myself, tested 3600X, 3800X, 3900X, 3950X. Obviously 16 core we cannot talk about yet, there is still an NDA on the 16 core, so unfortunately we cannot disclose that information, but for 6, 8 and 12 core is what I tested. Um, I have information here, so looking at a 3600X, it's advertised with a maximum boost of 4.4, 3800X 4.5, 3900X with 4.6, maximum boost with XFR. When I tested my CPUs, the 3900X, the 12 core did a maximum of 4.5 and usually it only did 4.4. 3800X was advertised at 4.5 while it only hit 4.45 max and usually did 4.4. 3600X advertised with 4.4 hit 4.4 once but usually did 4.3. The reason for that is that now AMD is advertising XFR clocks with like the absolute maximum possible. More is not possible. Comparing to Ryzen 2000, let's say a 2700X would overclock itself 100 megahertz higher due to XFR than what it was advertised for. So with XFR you can get a higher boost on Ryzen 2000 than what was advertised. Ryzen 3000 is advertising the absolute maximum clock possible in theory which usually doesn't happen. I tested this with AIOs, with air coolers, with custom water cooling where the CPU was not hitting more than 40 degrees Celsius. It never in any circumstance hit the maximum clock for the 12 core and for the 8 core, which is something, I mean, I can understand that it's kind of following the specs that they're saying the specs would allow a maximum clock of this, but then they should also specify in which condition. Because this is kind of uh, kind of disappointing. You're thinking it should boost to 4.6, but it it just maximum boosts to 4.5, and you're thinking why? What's the problem? I have a I don't know 400 euro motherboard. I have a 500 euro custom water cooling loop, and it's still not boosting to the max. That's what you can expect from those CPUs. So don't go by the maximum advertised clock because usually, or at least, I think I had 12 CPUs. None of them would do the maximum advertised clock. Okay, so overclocking manually across all cores, all the CPUs I had were doing 4.2 to 4.3. Only one CPU would do 4.3 across all cores with a maximum voltage of 1.45, which is fairly high. Personally, I would recommend 1.35 to 1.4 volt maximum because afterwards it doesn't really scale anymore. You 
overclock or you give your CPU additional 50 milli millivolt and it will result in additional, I don't know, 25 megahertz. That's not worth it. Typically maximum sweet spot is 1.35 to 1.4. Still I tried it up to 1.45, maximum stable prime 95, 4.2 to 4.3. That's what you can expect from those CPUs. 5 gigahertz, unless you use liquid nitrogen, but even on liquid nitrogen I had CPUs that would not do 5G. I have to make that absolutely clear. So don't ever expect those CPUs to do 5G. That's absolutely far from anything that's possible. Now that we clarified the overclocking, we will talk about power and frequency scaling over temperature. I tested a 12 core AMD Ryzen 3000 with uh, fixed voltage of 1.45 with a liquid nitrogen container started at 50 degrees celsius cooled down in 10 mega and 10 degrees celsius steps and recorded the maximum possible frequency in cinebench r15 while i also um, recorded the maximum power consumption looking at those numbers we are starting at minus 40 minus 140 degrees celsius which results in a power consumption of 116 watt in cinebench r15 with a clock of 4850 megahertz. At minus 50 it's 130 watt with 4600 megahertz so we're losing about 250 megahertz and the uh, uh, power consumption is increasing by 14 watt just by losing 90 degrees celsius. At zero degrees celsius 144 watt 4450 megahertz. 30 degrees celsius which is more something that you could achieve with an absolutely incredible custom water cooling loop then it's, uh, or maybe a chiller, it's 157 watt and 4275 megahertz. At 50 degrees celsius, which is more realistic with a normal custom water cooling loop, it's 175 watt and 4200 megahertz. And that's where you can kind of draw the conclusion from that by every 20 degrees celsius lower temperature you can overclock your CPU by an additional 50 to 100 megahertz. Also very interesting to see that you can go from 4.2 to 4.85 just by lowering the temperature. You're not increasing any voltages, not touching anything. It's pure temperature that will allow you, your CPU to clock 650 megahertz higher than before. Which is also why we can reach those massive clocks of like 5.3 when we're overclocking with liquid nitrogen. If you find a CPU that can do minus 180 and you increase the CPU uh, voltage to maybe 1.55, 1.6, that's the point where you can get something like 5.3, but that's also an absolutely golden CPU. A lot of CPUs I tested can only do 5 or 5.1 G even with liquid nitrogen. Now that we talked about all those basics, we will delete a Ryzen 5 3600, that's just a tradition. Whenever new videos are coming out for launches, I will always try to straight delete one of the new CPUs. That's why we will delete Ryzen 5 3600. It's basically because I have multiple of those and from all the other chips, I only have one or some of them I already had to return, like the 12 core CPU. That's why, yeah, we only have the six core CPU right now for deleting, but whatever we find out, we should be able to directly transferred to all the other CPUs, at least the conclusion. For deleting we will use the Delete Dimate 2 with the additional tool of this and this, which is basically the AMD kit, which we developed for the AMD Ryzen 2000 APUs, which were not soldered, but for the Ryzen 3000 we already know that the CPUs are soldered. That's why I will also start with using a razor blade, cutting all the glue from the edge to release the pressure onto the PCB from the side. Essentially, we will push with a daily die made from the side, but all the force will go onto the PCB. I kind of want to lower the pressure or the force on the PCB a little bit. That's why we will cut the glue first and then we will use pressure. We will not heat up the CPU this time. That's or should not be necessary for the lidding. Did that multiple times with a soldered CPU. So that's what we are going to try now. For additional protection of the pins I'm using a little bit of tape, just tape it across the pins which makes it easier for handling and I don't have to be that careful when I put in the screw inside the Dilly Die Mate. For the lidding itself we make use of metal fatigue. 
basically means we're pushing the CPU into one direction by one to two millimeters. Then we take out the CPU out of the delay die mate and push it again from the opposite direction. And that's the procedure we do repeated multiple times until the heat spreader comes off from the CPU. The deleting just confirms what we already knew before, the CPU is soldered with indium. We see the indium sticking to the I.O. chip which is sitting more in the middle and also of course to the CPU die which is sitting more in the corner of the CPU. Luckily indium is extremely soft and therefore can easily be removed with a sharp knife. Removing it from the heat spreader is quite easy and you don't have to be that careful but removing it from the CPU you really have to be careful and you have to make sure that you don't go across the corner itself of the chip because if you do that it's quite easy that you break a part of the corner of the chip and if that happens to you the risk of damaging the chip is really significant so if you're deleting one of those CPUs or in general if you're deleting a soldered CPU and you're using a knife to remove the indium always make sure that you're not going over the edge directly. Now we are preparing the dies of the Ryzen 3000 with Conductonaut liquid metal compound. CPU is deleted, I replaced the indium solder by liquid metal. I already mounted everything back in the system. Heat spreader is back on the CPU. I mounted the Corsair AIO again, but the temperatures look really bad. I recorded the idle temperature previously. It was 32 to 34, typically just in Windows idle, but now it's like 60 degrees Celsius. For idle, that's just way too much, which indicates that the contact between the heat spreader and the CPU is bad which kind of makes sense. You know that there is this thick indium sheet, which is the solder sheet between your chip and the heat spreader. We removed this indium sheet, which is something like 0.5, maybe up to one millimeter. I didn't record it, but it should be something in this direction. And the heat spreader is made to sit on the chip while the solder sheet is in between. If we remove that, we still have this gap. The heat spreader cannot completely go down and onto the chip because of the height difference. That's why we will now remove the heat spreader again and grind down the edges or the edge of the heat spreader and see if we can improve the temperature. Now that we grinded down the IHS by about 0.1 to 0.2 millimeter, the temperatures in idle look much more promising, look the same as before, about 30 to 34 degree Celsius. That's perfectly in line. The CPU is overclocked to 4.25, 1.45 volt, which is about the maximum you can get out of those CPUs, especially when it comes to voltage. Shouldn't really use much more because it really doesn't scale. For testing, I'm using Prime 95 26.6, so non-AVX with 12K FFT length. I'm first heating up the system over 10 minutes, and then I'm recording the average temperature over time for 10 minutes. So we have the average CPU temperature over 10 minutes, which I think is a better indicator than just using maximum values. For stock, I had a maximum temperature or average temperature of 92.4 degrees Celsius over 10 minutes. After deleting, the temperature dropped to 88.2 degrees Celsius, which is an improvement of 4.2 degrees Celsius which is really not much. That's kind of expected. It's very similar to Ryzen 2000, similar improvement. Also, I really didn't expect much more. 
soldering looked exactly the same so why would it be different and considering that when we just take a look back at the frequency power scaling on ln2 we know that we need like 20 degrees celsius benefit for 50 to 75 megahertz that's absolutely not worth it from the four degrees celsius improvement on prime 95 you can maybe get five megahertz maybe 10 that's really for considering the effort and risk that's involved I would not recommend to delete Ryzen 3000 CPU. That would be the conclusion from my side when it comes to deleting. The conclusion overall for Ryzen 3000, at least overclocking wise, um, when you use a voltage of 1.35 to 1.4, you can expect 4.2 to 4.3 um, gigahertz while the power consumption is very solid power consumption typically for uh, six core is uh, maximum something like 120 watt um, eight core something like 150 160 um, 12 core should be something about let me check 180 watt maximum 190 in this direction so power consumption to performance the relation of those cpus is really really good i can just say yeah Power consumption of the CPU um, compared to performance is very impressive, especially idle power consumption. That's something where we will take a look at in a different video because that's it's so much content um, when it comes to the idle power consumption that we will just do that in a separate video. Tomorrow or the day after tomorrow we will talk about the chipset power consumption, which will, yeah, I'm still testing this but I'm not sure what's going on there. It's uh, something with X570, not, not really sure. You will see in the next video. So I hope you enjoyed this video and uh, enjoyed the basic information you got for Ryzen 3000 so you know what you can expect when it comes to overclocking, deleting, temperature wise. Ah, one more thing before I forget it. It could be that we have a hotspot problem on the Ryzen 3000 CPUs. If you just think about that the CPU core is in the corner while all the CPU heat sinks are mainly designed for having the hotspot exactly in the center, uh, just talking about AIOs or custom water cooling uh, CPU coolers, they're all manufactured and designed for having the hotspot exactly in the center, while all the CPUs are now having it either in the corner if it's um, a single chiplet uh, CPU or when it's like a 12 core, it has those two chiplets, then uh, it's just more shifted upwards to the middle of the CPU. I think maybe if we shift the cooler a little bit or I don't know if there is a different cooler uh, hot plate design then there could be improvements in temperature which I think would be possible because for now the temperatures look really really hot which kind of makes sense it's very high power density with seven nanometers eight cores in this very small chiplet in the corner okay that's it for this video hope you enjoyed the information see you next time